society has witnessed a widening of our perception and knowledge, we have naturally developed a desire to effectively cultivate this knowledge in our students. It is our goal to maintain our status as one of the world's leading educators, which is how the No Child Left Behind Act enters the discussion. It is a policy whose initial intention was to inform of the success of education, and more importantly, what needed to change. Yet in recent years, the provocative question has arisen. Is No Child Left Behind helping or hurting our education? My colleague Gus Kimball and I have come here to Wood River High School in Idaho's Blaine County School District, the finances. Located near the famed Sun Valley Ski Resort, the town of Haley, Idaho is home to the Blaine County School District, the top school system in the state of Idaho. The district consists of eight total schools, four elementary schools, a middle school, and three high schools, with Wood River High School being the primary school. At Blaine County, we have asked three local experts to weigh in on the No Child Left Behind Act. I do everything that handles, that has anything to do with money. Uh, I'm in charge of the transportation department, I'm in charge of the maintenance department, I'm in charge of the school lunch program, and anything that has to do with spending money for the district or collecting money for the district, I'm in charge of. So. Along with the communications director, and we were at Java this morning talking to patrons, answering questions about education, about legislation, uh, things that are coming down the pike, uh, things that we're dealing with, uh, curriculum changes, things like that, the math curriculum, the science adoption that's coming up, just talking about overall business of the district. Then I came back here for a meeting regarding um, the substitute um, placement system because I'm in charge of the guest teachers in the district through the HR department. So um, I'm not only the assistant superintendent, but I'm also the human resource director. Uh, that involves um, the evaluation of all our teachers and the um, contracts for all our teachers as well as all the benefit packages. So a typical day in my, in my life would be come in, um, have a meeting with what we call the dog panel, which is the superintendent's cabinet. It's the special ed curriculum. Mr. Blackman as the assistant superintendent and the head of HR, our business manager and myself, have a, have a couple hour meeting um, to talk about issues they may be having in their job. Um, finish that meeting, you know, this is what I always tell my daughter, I have a sixth grade daughter who really wants to know what I do, and what I usually tell her is I meet for a living, um, which isn't very exciting. So I might leave that meeting and, and go to a school. I was over at Woodside Elementary School this morning, go in, um, talk to the principal, go in and see the teachers, um, hang out with the kids for a little while, do those kind of things, come back. I'm proud of this uh, piece of legislation. I think it's made an enormous difference, particularly in the lives of some of our poor students. Uh, this country needs to uh, get it right when it comes to public education. And uh, the bill that I was honored to sign is an important first step toward making sure every child gets a good education in America. Spearheaded by George W. Bush and signed into law on January 8, 2002, the No Child Left Behind Act supports standards-based education reform based on the premise that setting high standards and establishing measurable goals can improve individual outcomes in education. In a partial response to global standings, the Act requires states to develop assessment and basic skills in order to receive federal school funding. We have asked our experts to give pros uh, to the Act. Perception, you're always looking at the perception of what the community thinks about every decision you make. And I think that's a good thing. You're always looking at kids and saying, how can we make kids more successful? And that's a good thing. Probably the biggest thing Nickleby has done positively has created a, a sense of accountability, um, which is why it came about in the first place. People want accountability for the educational system. Um, I think, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. So it, it, it has put more emphasis on the fact that we need to do a better job as administrators in our evaluations. Um, we need to take them more seriously, and I agree with that. I think it's the most important thing we do as building administrators is the evaluation of our staff. Because the most important thing we do, the most important thing I do, is put good teachers in front of kids. Because <clears throat> that is the biggest impact on education. All the research shows you that it's not the curriculum, it's the teacher delivering the curriculum. Because everyone knows that, you know, if you have good curriculum and you have a poor teacher, you're going to have bad results. And if you have mediocre curriculum but you have a great teacher, you're going to have good results. 
And so um, Nickleby has really put it in the forefront that that is really important and that we want more accountability to who's in front of our kids. So in that way, I think it's a good thing. When I think about it, this is, this is the thing that it did, generally speaking. Um, it, it, enabled, it enabled individual states, not really the collective United States, but individual states to look at school districts, have some benchmark um, that we can say, oh, our kids are achieving at a high level or they're not achieving at a high level. So bringing accountability into the system was not a bad thing. I think No Child Left Behind has, has made, made education a lot more uh, thought pro provocative. People are, are thinking about the decisions that they're making a lot more now than they were 10 years ago. They're thinking about uh, the impacts of the decisions that they make and how they're going to spend the money a lot more meaningful now than it was 10 years ago because now you're being held accountable for the money that's being spent as well as the actions and the performance of the students. You know, when you look at education, we've never been held accountable for, for the performance of kids in the classroom, and now we are. So what it does do is it makes us work very hard to make sure those kids in GME's classroom are being as, as successful as they possibly can be. So what it has done is make us focus on every child intently, and it's made us look at our data and fully understand who we are and the job we're doing. That's a very good thing. Nothing wrong with that. I also strongly believe that uh, we, we want to make sure the No Child Left Behind Act continues to work. It's a, you, you measure every day. That's why you're successful business people. I mean, you know what your business is doing. I believe we ought to extend that same principle to our public schools and ask a simple question. Can a child read at grade level? And in order to determine that, that's, that's why you measure. And if the answer is yes, we all say great. If the answer is no, the answer question will be, then what are you going to do about it? And so the principle behind the No Child Left Behind Act is to set high standards, believe every child can learn, and measure to see if we're getting results. And Congress need not weaken such a good piece of legislation. But is education like a business? We ask our experts their opinions on these high-stakes statistics and measures in education. The problem is, is the measures. You know, what we're looking at is, is standardized test scores, and that's all we're looking at. Um, the problem with standardized test scores is they do not take into account um, differentiated education and, and the other things that people are also saying they are. This is what No Child Left Behind really does. It, it, it paints one bar, and they call it the proficiency bar, and um, they expect everybody to get over that bar. It's like a high jump. And here's what they didn't do. They didn't create a growth model that's based on individual students. And so, um, you know, where, where you're at, let's just say, Gus, where you're at in the seventh grade, if they were following you to eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade, and they had created benchmarks that said, oh, he's really making progress, not what we would call maintenance. Maintenance means you'd be about the same, but you'd be a year older. Progress means you're accelerating, you're learning. That would have been a good thing. But what they did was they created a proficiency line that's the same for every single student. And the problem with that is it's the same whether you come out of really good households who value education or you come out of really uh, poverty homes where they don't have time to talk to their children about education, whether you speak fluent English like you did because you were raised here, or whether you're someone, and we have a lot in our valley, I'm sure you know, um, students that come to us and don't speak any English, and within, uh, you only have two years to get those students proficient in the language, that's not going to happen. I mean, that's a very difficult challenge. A good example is Woodside Elementary. Woodside Elementary School has got the highest Hispanic population of an elementary school in the state of Idaho. And, and, and uh, Woodside Elementary also has, uh, they're in about the 85th percentile in test scores, and they're a failing school district in the eyes of Nickelby. But if you compare them statewide, they're one of the top performing schools in the elementary program. If a school is not meeting certain marks for every single student, 
they're labeled as failing schools, and they're not failing schools. So when you look at when you look at our school district, we had four schools, including your school, that is under a school improvement. And you think about Wood River High School, and it's one of the great high schools that we have in Idaho. There's just no doubt about it. Well, then you got to go out and you got to tell the public you're a failing school. And so, for an example, like Blaine County School District, we're scoring in the 90th percentile, but we're still considered a failing school district because Nickel B requires that you have uh, performance gains every year. And even though you are at the 94th or 95th percentile, if there's no gain in progress, they consider that as a failing school. Really? Really? We're doing the best job in the entire state. We have the highest scores of anybody, and we're gonna go tell somebody that we're a failing school, and yet this school over here that moved from 50 to 60 isn't? I mean, I, I got examples of that all over the state. So here's Blaine County, who's got one of the best, if not the best, education system in the state of Idaho, who should be kind of a poster child for what education should look like, we're being punished because we're so good. You know what I'm saying? Because their expectation of us is 100%. But let's say you go to Caldwell, their expectation of Caldwell is simply to move from 50% to 60%. And, and the problem with that challenge is it's an artificial challenge because that's not how we don't learn all as a group. So not every student in the 11th grade it should be expected to achieve the same level or the same way. It also diminishes the, the well, like what you guys are doing here today. You're making a documentary movie. Here's what No Child Left Behind doesn't do. It doesn't let us account for that. That's creativity. You know, I was an art teacher uh, years ago. It doesn't, there's no way for us to look at a child and say, oh, they really are amazing. All, all children have gifts. This child is really an amazing, um, because they're, for instance, let's just take American government. Um, they're not just reading an American government textbook. They've gone out, they've decided to make a documentary, they're researching local government. We can't account for any of that. But do you think it's learning? Because I really think it's great learning. You know, AYP, every student is supposed to make AYP. The, gover the government's expectation under Nickleby Law is that 100% of our students reach AYP, which is average yearly progress, and that they score a certain amount on the high stakes standard tests, ISAT. Everybody's supposed to pass ISAT. What's the reality of that? Do you have students at the high school that are gonna be able to pass ISAT? So for example, special education. How about uh, Jamie Ellison's classroom? Those kids are gonna have a hard time passing the ISAT. Even though for you, it might be a fairly low bar for them, it's very high. I mean, really what it's done is it's made it a lot more expensive to educate students in Blaine County because we have to develop a lot of programs to try to bring those Latino kids up to grade level before they get, you know, into the high, high stakes testing arena within the second year. So, I mean, we've, we've built the dual immersion programs, we've built the ESL programs to, and really beefed up staff in those areas to try to get those kids up quicker. Have a lot of those ESL programs been implemented because of Nickleby? Yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah. No two kids are the same. No two people are the same. And everybody learns different. And right now, I don't know, when I first got into education, there were three identified learning styles. Audio, you know, um, hands-on or tactile, okay, um, or, vis or visual. So, um, and now there's nine, you know what I mean? And I, and I, and I guarantee you there's more than that, you know, because everybody has a different way of how they assimilate information. So when you go to standardized test scores, <coughs> excuse me, when you get into standardized test scores, you can't take any of that into account. So here's the bar, and either you get over it or you don't. And I think for us to try to say, well, you, you either have a very high proficiency level in mathematics and reading, and language usage, or um, you're not successful, is counter to what we believe, what I believe, it's counter to what our community believes. You know, we did a, a strategic plan four years ago, and the whole community was involved, and here's what they said. We want to help create 21st century learners. So a 21st century learner isn't necessarily someone that can 
do math. It's someone that is collaborative, critical thinkers. Before you started a movie, you must have sat down with each other and said, well, how are we going to approach this? I don't know if you made, if you made boards to show the different things, but if you did, um, you know, that's, that's a very high level of critical thinking, very high level, and there's no accounting for that at all. After hearing both sides of the argument, we again ask the proactive question, is No Child Left Behind helping or hurting our students? I'm Nathan Niffin signing off for K&K Productions. Enjoy your days.